made copy of the slides. You'll need a pen to write because there'll be some questions to answer in the process of all of this. I will give you the answers. Okay. When you're ready, Judy. Just so you know, Judy's videoing this. So I hope that we can get it up online. We keep trying. Okay. So, really, it's confirmed physical health status. That's a technical title. But this is about anatomy and physiology. And we're going to talk about some of the basic systems today. And we'll only talk about a few of the systems because if I was to do the whole presentation, it would take us two or three days. Um, but there's some important questions amongst all these. And my advice is write down your answers. The idea of the questions is to give you an idea about the level that we're asking you at. It's not going to be exceedingly deep and meaningful. We're not going to ask you for the structure of um, DNA and you know, RNA and all that sort of thing, but we might ask you things about cells, sort of the basic information, you know, what's the smallest structure in the body or what, you know, what does, you know, what's the most complicated structure in the body, that sort of thing. And it's all up there online. Part of my job at the moment is to go through and um, make sure that the questions we're asking marry up to the textbook and marry up to the online. So we're making sure we get that, so we're making sure that the answers are there. I believe it's an open book exam anyway. With that, don't bring too many books <coughs> along. Bring your textbook. Um, because I don't know about you, but I've gone to eight book exams where I've had three or four books, and I spent five minutes a question looking up the, the answers on two or three books and confirming <coughs> it, which is really silly. It was a research exam and it was difficult, but what cost me more was the fact that I didn't answer any questions because I was too busy looking at up in books to get it right. So it's anatomy and physiology, it's, it's going to come out of your books mainly and it'll come off your, uh, off what Tony King's name, so have your book there, it's a really good one, any crib notes. Our yep. books are on the iPad, so you mean we can bring the iPad or we have to I bring a physical think, book? <coughs> I think, and I'll confirm this, you, you can use your iPad books because that would be reasonable. Yeah, I don't have it. Um, no one does. No one does. <laughs> But I, I can't see why we can't. Well, that's the thing. That's a bit double, isn't it? Google yeah. all the answers. So, we will start. Okay. So, how does knowing anatomy and physiology relate to nursing care? I think that's pretty common sense, isn't it? If we can understand the structures and functions of our body, we can understand what's happening to our patient and where it's happening to our patient and even why it's happening to our patient. So we can then apply the appropriate care to our patient. So we also have to take into account when we're looking at someone and deciding whether they're, <coughs> what care we have to provide, how ill they are, and later on, if we get down doing an assessment on someone, right, if we know there are the range of factors in there, if we know why they might be febrile, or why their heart is going really fast, tachycardic, right, why they're hypertensive, have a high blood pressure, right, if we understand the anatomy and physiology of it, we might be able to understand where it's coming from and look at what we can use to combat that. <coughs> and it tells us a bit about a patient. Someone having a high blood pressure and a fast heart rate, it probably comes from a different source if they have a low blood pressure and a high, pass rate, a high, high pulse rate. So we'd have to understand it could be cardiac, it could be chemical. So, exactly. So it identifies the problems. Okay, so first of our questions, what is the science that involves the study of structure of the body? What do they call it? Anatomy. 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 Uh, structure of anatomy. 
anatomy, structure. It's really important. So, if that's anatomy, what is physiology? Function. Function. Okay. okay. So, that's okay. okay. Yeah? Look, give an answer. If you're wrong, you're wrong, that's okay. <laughs> Trust me, we all make mistakes. We all say silly things, like I told you. I printed a, uh, a black PowerPoint, or a dark PowerPoint with black writing on it. So, it aims to understand the mechanisms of, li of living, right? How living things work. Human physiology studies how our cells, muscles and organs work together and how they interact. So, it's how we work. It's how our body works. And the processes to, that go to create it. There you go. That's okay. There's not too many of those long answers. Anybody got any questions whilst we're in there? No? Good. Oh, oh it's more about the exam. Um, one person is saying it's a two hour exam with only multi choice. The other said it was three hour with multi choice and long answer. I can tell you one thing it is all multi choice at this it's stage. And as they decide to change it, <laughs> the number of questions varies. Um, because we're looking at the questions at the moment. Okay. To make sure it covers all the units. But as far as I'm concerned, multi it's choice. all multi-choice. There were short answer ones on the online one, and that's where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer online. Okay, so. What happens if we fail the test? Um, you will have to do a reset. So you get to reset it? Yeah, absolutely. All the exams that we do, you get a reset. There's no failure out of here. There's always the opportunity. And the last time when we did a reset, I ran a reset tutorial. And um, everybody did quite well in the reset. Mm. No, but what percentage is a pass? We're debating that at the moment. Mm. We're trying to decide if it's going to be a longer exam with um, a 70% pass mark or a shorter exam with a 100% pass mark. We've just put that to... Um, the appropriate panel, because we have to work with Careers Australia, we have to meet their criteria as well. So, it'll be a short exam with a 100 pass, or a longer exam with a 70% pass, mate. So, we'll see how that goes. And it's not an open book, is it? It is. It is. Nobody, sorry. It is an open book exam, I'm told. And just bring our normal textbook. Just bring your normal textbook. It won't be out of any other textbooks. So the textbook that we've been here, or the one that we go and buy? The one that's on our iPad. Oh, we'll take that at the whole iPad too. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm well, so sorry I'm not. Don't apologise, don't. No, it's cool. Oh. <laughs> We're on about the second <laughs> slide. Oh, that's all right. I thought it was 9.30, and I grabbed my iPad, and I went, oh, God. That's all right. It's good. Okay, I do have some interesting videos amongst them. Uh, I don't, I, I think that because they're informative and they're sometimes a little bit interesting.
component of cardiovascular system. It creates pressure every time it beats. This pressure moves the blood to every cell in our body. Now let us see what is cardiac cycle. The sequence of events in a single heartbeat is known as cardiac cycle. This cycle involves the systole or contraction and diastole or relaxation of atria and ventricles. Look at this figure. In this, you can make out that all the four chambers of heart are in relaxed stage, that is, joint diastole stage. Now you will observe here that bicuspid and the tricuspid walls are open. So what will happen? The blood will flow from the pulmonary vein and vena cava to left and right atrium respectively. Right? Now, the arterial systole is initiated when SA node sends out an electric signal. During arterial systole, the atria undergoes a continuous contraction which forcefully passes the blood into the ventricles through tricuspid and the bicuspid walls. Ventricular systole begins when ventricles are filled with blood. The AV node, as shown here, picks up the signal and then conducts it throughout the ventricles. This stimulates the ventricular contraction and as the ventricular contraction increases, the ventricular pressure causes the closure of AV walls. Now this continuous contraction causes the further increase in ventricular pressure. What will happen because of this? It will open the semi walls and the blood flows into the pulmonary artery and the outer. Now this closing of AV walls here results in producing the first heart sound, lung. Now observe here that ventricles are in relaxed state now. During ventricular diastole, the ventricles relax, arterial pressure falls and blood begins to flow back into the ventricles. This reversal of pressure causes the semilunar walls to shut, producing the second heart sound, da. So now you know what produces the sound, la, da. Meanwhile, the atria have been filling with the blood and as the ventricles relax, blood flows from the atria into the ventricles, forcing the AV walls to open again. A very simple explanation of the heart. I quite like it. It is fantastic. I like it. So it's a good basic understanding. It's a good way to understand when you're doing blood pressure as well. What what they mean by diastolic and systolic, right? Why there's a pressure difference? Why one pressure is higher than the other? It's all about that squeezing action of the heart. So, we've got to know, if you want to look at the heart, <coughs> listen to the heart and do things, we want to know where it's located. So, where is it located? Good point, yep. Where, if you're looking at someone, where would you say? Right or left side? Middle of the chest. Middle of the chest. Left side behind a big one. Left side. When you when you get to do ECGs, you'll hear the term intercostal space. It is located at the fifth intercostal space. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, was that the fifth one? Yeah. Fifth one. We'll, we'll get you some in for a sec. Okay. So it's towards the left side of the chest. Anterior. Do you know? Do you know what we mean? Anterior to. To the front. Anterior to the spinal cord, so to the front of the spinal cord, good. And posterior, what's posterior? The back. The back, behind. Posterior to the breastbone. And it's at the level of the fifth intercostal space. If you feel down your ribs, you'll find from up here near your collarbone, you'll work out little spaces between each rib, they're intercostal spaces and it is at the level of the fifth intercostal space. Sometimes with larger hearts, that sort of thing, it can be, but that's a good approximation on most of the population. And that's, you've got to have an approximation so people can do an ECG and 
get a picture of the heart. Okay. So there are lots of different vessels of the heart. There are some main ones. <coughs> Sorry, do you want to go back? No? Cool. There are vessels of the heart. There's the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava or cava, depends on being talked to. Right? Their job is to return right, blood to the heart via the right atrium. The four pulmonary veins return blood from the lungs to the left atrium. <coughs> the pulmonary trunk carries the blood out to the lungs. If you have a little look on our picky there, look at red dot, there's the pulmonary, they're actually the pulmonary veins. Okay, that's the, and you can see what it says, it's a trunk and it spreads out like a little branches. That goes over your lungs. So why would we want to pump blood to our lungs? Oxygenate. To oxygenate the blood, exactly. And the aorta, which is a very important artery, <coughs> carries blood to the systemic circulation. It's the biggest artery in our body. It's that big curve one there. And they have things like, you'll hear the term triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysms where they have a bulge in the aorta, and if they burst, the patient dies. They can prevent them from bursting, which they try to do, but once they go, they're gone. Particularly if they're up on the arch of the aorta. So, and a person will bleed out in under a minute once it bursts. But the largest blood vessel in the body originates in the left Ventricle, that's where it comes from. Two coronary arteries, which are found at the very beginning of the aorta. You can see them up there. Right, down here. Up there on that. Right, the beginning of the aorta, right? They carry <laughs> blood to the heart muscle, right? They're supplying, as in that's why they're called coronary arteries. So they carry oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. So it keeps the heart alive. And the coronary sinus, that returns the blood from the heart muscle back into the right atrium. So it can pump it around again and keep it all supplied nicely. Okay, there's a little picture of our circulation. You'll see it on your little chart there. It just explains in a very easy to follow fashion, I think, how the uh, blood or the circulatory system runs blood around your body. Okay. So, normal cardiac output. Do you know what cardiac output means? It's how much blood we put out. Right? So, Normal cardiac, how much blood do you think we pump, our heart pumps per minute? Five litres. Five litres, well done. Absolutely right. <laughs> Five litres per minute. Now, that five litres, right, how we get cardiac output, <coughs> the heart rate and the stroke volume determine cardiac output. So, heart rate, how many beats per minute, times the stroke volume, so that's a stroke. Alright, so what it pushes out of the heart. Is the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute. So it's always represented in mils of blood per minute. Or mils per minute if you just... Okay. Oh, back again. That's why they have the little flicker for me. Okay, that's good. Tell me to stop, I'm happy. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the endocrine system. Right, the endocrine system and the nervous system are the two 
main communicating and coordinating systems in your body. The endocrine system regulates all those chemicals and it helps produce all the chemicals and hormones that go around our body and the nervous system helps regulate them. It sends the signals to release the hormone. So it tells the endocrine system, I need this much insulin. Or I need you to stop producing insulin, my sugars are getting too low. Alright? So it regulates nearly everything. Everything from the brain right through. So the endocrine system, composed of endocrine glands, pretty common sense. They secrete hormones, which are the chemical messenger of our body. So it says, okay, off you go, tell, tell the pancreas to become insulin resistant. Don't, don't give out any more insulin. Okay? Hormones are classified as either proteins or steroids. Hormones bind to large tissue or organs. Okay? So they are the things that tell those large tissues and organs what to do. Three mechanisms that control the secretion of hormones. Right? There are the main three me mechanisms. Okay, so the endocrine system is made up of the pituitary gland, its hormone, and their tag tissues and organs. All right. So the pituitary gland, its hormones, <coughs> and their tag tissues and organs. Right, so part of the endocrine system is the thyroid gland. Right? It's hormones and it targets tissues and it's target tissues and organs. I would remember that targets tissues and organs thing a lot. That will go to that. Now about the thyroxine, we won't be asking you about tetraiodine, thyroid. <coughs> we don't go that deep and meaningful or calcitonin. Interesting to know, know what they do, but are they relevant to this? No. The, that's additional stuff. So the next one is the adrenal glands. Their hormones target tissues and organs. So the, it includes the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. Adrenal glands. And the pancreas. They get a lot with the pancreas in this day and age of nursery because of diabetes. Right. Two endocrine hormones, so it, it secretes glycogen <coughs> and insulin. So, what do you think insulin does? Regulates Yep. It helps us regulate our sh high sugar level. Mm. Or if we've got a low sugar level, glycogen comes out. Oh, okay. So it keeps a sugar balance in our body, doesn't it? So its target tissues, or its target tissues, are the cells and liver. Alright. We're going down to all the sex glands, or the female ovaries. Part of our endocrine system. So we're covering a lot of the body, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're going all over the place. <coughs> so it controls our <coughs> secondary sex characteristics, production of overall eggs. So. The endocrine system, there's the thymus gland and its target tissues. Right, the thymus gland plays a crucial role in development of the immune system before birth. Babies come out with a very weak immune system and it takes a little while to kick in, but the <coughs> thymus helps develop that in utero inside mum. Right, so the thymus, sorry, was that the immune system for the baby or the mother? Yep, the immune baby. system before birth. So when it helps create that immune system, it gives them a bit of protection, right? And a few few months after, right, it keeps building it up. After puberty, 
the gland shrinks and still it still plays an active role, but it's not doing that immune system because the babies develop its own natural immunity. Sorry about that too much. So common disorders in our endocrine system, diabetes myelitis or non-insulin dependent diabetes or type 2 diabetes. They want, they're trying to go to the type 1s and type 2s, but they're still the old non-insulin, insulin dependent, all those sorts of things. So I've covered all types. So we've got diabetes insipidus, that's its original name. Insulin dependent diabetes myelitis, type 1 diabetes. Acromegaly, giantism. And you can see that there where the person's got giantism there. Graves disease, hypothyroidism, don't worry about the my, my eczema. Hypothyroidism, the goiter. Oh, I'm probably older, so I'll get away with it. But you had the lump in the throat. And when I was a kid at school, they used to give us the lyodine tablets. Anyone here old enough to remember that? Well, I'm willing to I admit am. they're old enough to admit, admit that. I'm old enough, but I don't remember the tablets. <laughs> they stopped giving it in, uh, I think, the 70s, 80s, probably about the 80s. Oh, where did you get them? At school? At school. They oh, were issued at school. Yeah, a little Ooh. white tablet they were. It was only a tiny thing. Oh. They were goiter tablets, oh, I was maybe. all. Okay. It's a long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> Something good for you to look up and have a read. Graves disease is a very complicated disease. Have a good look at it. It's very interesting, it's very common. Maybe they gave them. Well, it's not as common as you think, but it's still common. It's diabetes. Right, what are three common physiological effects? Insulin deficiency, right? Hyperglyph. What are three common effects of hyperglycemia? Insulin deficiency, same thing. Hyper. So what does hyper mean? Oh, it mean like thirsty. Up. Oh. High, oh. exactly, up. Hypo is low. Oh, yeah. Hyper. So what do you think? You think of three things that someone would feel if they were hyperglycemic. Oh, thirsty. Good one. Hot flushes. Yep, yeah, could feel that too. Mm -hmm. Excessive thirst. They're thirsty. They would get acidosis. And that could come along with hot flushes. Acidosis. So they'll get acidic and you'll smell it on their breath. They'll develop ketones. <coughs> Not everybody does, but... And you hear them talk about a fruity breath. Um, smells a bit like acetone out of your nail polish remover, <coughs> that's what you'd all understand yeah. probably better. Yeah. So, acidosis. And they get glucose in their urine. So it's really sweet smelling? No, it's like, like nail almost like overripe fruit you'll smell on their bread. Right. Um, glucose in the urine is the best way to check it, really. All the pinpricks, at least it's non invasive, they pee, you dip a stick in. Oh yeah, whoa. So acidosis, which is up there, is an increased acidity of the blood, right? And the body tissue. So acidosis <coughs> is said to occur when the arterial pH falls below 7.35, right? <coughs> Except in the fetus, right? Where its counterpart, alkalosis, occurs uh, at a pH over 7.45. So 7.35 to 7.45 is where a blood pH is. There are other pHs in the body that don't relate to that. The pH of your eye is not that. All around 7, but 7.35 to 7.45. That's all right. That long one should be on there. Mm. Yeah, you need a bit too hard to read. Ah. So I wonder what my glasses. I ain't got one. Might have to increase that size of that one. 
We learn as we go along. to think about. What is the treatment for ketoacidosis? Remember I mentioned ketones? Right, ketones you produce it when you're hyperglycemic. <coughs> so acidosis, you become acidotic when you're hyperglycemic. You get, an ac you become, you get acidosis. So a high level of acid. So what do you think would be a treatment for ketoacidosis? That means they're pretty sick. DKA is the terminal here, diabetic ketoacidosis. Someone has it is DKA. So they give insulin and correct the electrolyte disturbances. Because you can imagine if your blood's acidic, you want to try and get that back to normal. Insulin will lower the sugar, but they will often give other drugs. I won't go into that because it just complicate the issue, but there are lots of other drugs they can give. Sodium bicarbonate's one of them. Not bacon, sadly. <laughs> okay. The renal system. So we're talking about kidneys. Important part of our body. <laughs> the kidneys are considered our most important organs of excretion. They eliminate a couple of different things, water being the most important, but also nitrogenous waste. What was the nitrogenous waste, the nitrogen waste. Urea, very good. Urea, water, electrolytes, and various toxins and drugs. So the urinary system very simply includes these structures, the kidneys. The kidneys are responsible for forming urine from the blood. They basically filter the blood and create the urine. The ureters carry the urine from the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder is just a temporary storage area for the urine. And the urethra is the tube that carries the urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. All right, so we're going to start with the kidneys. They're in the posterior aspect of the abdomen in the flank area. They're outside of the peritoneum, so we call them retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneal membrane. They're protected by the ribs, renal fascia, and adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, you already know, is what? Fat. There's a thick pad of fat that surrounds the kidneys to help protect them. So very simply... Two kidneys, two ureters, one bladder, one urethra. Urethra and ureter look very similar. Be careful you don't confuse the two. Two very different structures. The kidney has three distinct regions. It's got a cortex and a medulla and also something called the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis is basically the open area in the middle. The cortex is the outer region and the medulla is the deeper uh, inner region. So this opening in the middle here, this is called the renal pelvis. And basically it's a funnel shape, and that's the opening to the end of the ureter, the proximal ureter right here. These things in here, those are called the renal pyramids. They're triangle shaped. They make up the medulla. Anywhere from 8 to 18 of these little triangle shapes in your kidneys. And this outer portion out here is the cortex. Blood supply. Blood supply is important in the kidneys, and the blood supply comes from the renal artery, which comes right off the aorta. About 25% of our entire cardiac output goes to the kidneys. So the kidneys are very sensitive to changes in blood pressure. If the blood pressure goes down, then the kidneys don't have as much blood to filter. If they don't have as much blood to filter, then they don't have as much to make urine with. So one of the first things that happens when our blood pressure goes down is we make less urine. So what do the kidneys do? They do quite a lot. They excrete that urea, that nitrogen waste, 
They also secrete uric acid, ammonia, and creatinine. Creatinine <clears throat> is a byproduct of muscle breakdown. It's one of the end results of muscle breakdown. The kidneys are hugely important in regulating blood volume because they determine how much water leaves the body. So if they let go of a lot of water, our blood volume goes down. Right? Does that make sense? If they hold on to a lot of water, they reabsorb a lot of water, then our blood volume is going to go up. If our blood volume goes up, what happens to our blood pressure? Up. If the kidneys get rid of water, then our blood volume is going down and our blood pressure will go down. Right? Did you ever hear of anybody taking um, blood pressure pills that make them urinate a lot? They're water pills. They're getting rid of excess volume in the hopes that their blood pressure will come down. Don't the agree. kidneys can also regulate the electrolyte content of the blood. The kidneys can say, nope, we need more sodium, I'm going to reabsorb more sodium. They can say, oh, we got to get rid of some calcium, I'm going to get rid of some calcium. They can say, oh, we need more chloride, hold on to chloride. So they can regulate the electrolyte content of the blood. Okay, so not only the water volume, but how many electrolytes are coming and going. The kidneys play a major role in the regulation of acid-base balance. Again, they control how many hydrogen ions leave in the urine or get held onto in the blood. So if we hold on to hydrogen ions, we're holding on to acids, we're going to make the blood more acidic. If we let go of all those hydrogen ions, we're losing hydrogen ions, then the blood's going to become more alkaline. All right, they play a role in the regulation of blood pressure. How do the kidneys regulate blood pressure? I just told it to you. If they hold on to water, it's going to increase the blood pressure. If they excrete the water, it's going to lower the blood pressure. And the kidneys also play a role in the regulation of red blood cell production. Anybody remember how? The kidneys get the message that the oxygen level is low because there's fewer red blood cells. The red blood cell concentration is low, so the oxygen level is low. The juxtaglomerular nephrons get the message in the kidneys that the oxygen level is low. So they secrete a substance called erythropoietin. They secrete that. It goes to the bone marrow, tells the bone marrow to increase their blood cell production. It will continue to increase its blood cell production until the oxygen levels rise again, and then the kidneys shut off. Negative feedback. So... They talked about erythropoietin there, EPO. We'll give it to EPO. All the cyclists yeah. of recent times, that's what they were supposedly injecting, was EPO. So the idea was to increase the red blood cells, increase the oxygen that they are carried on those red blood cells, so you get more stamina, you last longer, you can get stronger bursts of energy. And at that stage, it wasn't illegal. That's the um, bike rider. What's his name? Mm. Um, yeah, Lance. 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 Yeah, Lance was doing the transfer. Yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah, probably hundreds of them. Yeah. Until they get. And when but he gets like to hear EPO, it's Talk a refresh for you. Okay. What do the kidneys excrete? The following. Water. Or they do a lot, they're pretty smart. Talking? The water. Water, what else? Acid. Urea. 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 Imagine yeah, those people really are going to renal yeah. failure. Yeah. How much, how much they can't control. We're not just talking about the ability to pass urine. We're talking about something that controls all the hormones in our bodies, that decides our blood pressure, yeah. the amount of red blood cells we produce. So how much oxygen we can carry. So that could affect our lungs as well, our heart, everything. So. When you think about it, someone comes in and they're acidotic and they're out of control, they are not got a you know, got poor renal function, they are an emergency because it can affect so many systems. I have a question. If you've got high blood pressure, yep. 
but they've checked your kidneys, and your kidneys are functioning fine, yep. and you drink plenty of fluid all the time yep. and everything else. They can't find a reason why. What would you suggest? It could be lots of things. It can be to do with your <laughs> cardiac function. So you might you might be um, pushing it out too hard, right? You might be getting strong contractions. It could be hormonal. So there's hormonals that trigger those things. And that might not be a kidney function, there might be a hormone going to your kidney saying, release more, increase my blood pressure. So there's lots of dozens and dozens of things. Stress itself mm -hmm. can bring up the blood pressure. So it can affect. So it can be that it's not your actual kidneys are not functioning, but they might be getting a message to say increase it. Or it could be that you're not passing enough urine. Right? <laughs> Diabetes, your blood thickens up because it's got all that nasty sugar in it, slows the, damages the kidney, so it can't function as well. It can't read all the signals properly. Neville, sorry, what's creatinine? Creatinine. Creatinine. Remember, it's a waste product from your muscles. From your muscles. Muscle yeah. Break. So that when you like when you when you're in bad stages, that is be showing up badly because their bodies. Yep. And when they when they do Muscle one of the weight. tests, common tests that they do when they do a full blood count in yep. hospital yep. is creatinine clearance, the ability to get rid of your creatinine out of your body. So people dying of cancer and stuff that have a high level of creatinine and because they could have had a lot of muscle, muscle destruction, yeah. yeah. Okay. I get it. Okay. And ammonia is the ammonia? Ammonia? That's normally a byproduct of different chemical processes, um, without going into a long. So this is what this is what the kidney. This is what the dilute, kidney gets rid gets of. Rid it excretes it all. It's all byproduct. So ammonia is a byproduct, and I think it comes from. No, I have to think about that one. And urea is obviously the excess fluid. Fluid and, stuff. and water and stuff. Yeah. Yep. So is that kidneys? Sorry? Both kidneys do the same function. Because... Um, like if you're having all these problems, would yep. that have to be like, because you've still got one functioning kidney, would they then... The kidneys are quite amazing, is it, in that one kidney can nearly do the job, yep. pretty close to doing the job of both kidneys when it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it adapts. If you've seen some of them, some people have a misfunction or a, a kidney that doesn't function and they actually graft another kidney onto it. And it can help make that that other kidney function. But isn't that in the old like days? Today, my fun I've only got one kidney. My yep. other one only functions forty percent. Yep. And I've never had anything done. Because your kidneys are still functioning appropriately. Yeah, because I control it with diet and. Yeah, kidney diet. transplants <coughs> are far more common, but getting donors is always an issue, isn't it? So the whole kidney would have to collapse in all the... Both, both the whole renal system, so both kidneys would have to go before they... Need to get a transplant. Yeah, before they'd start doing that, yeah. Oh. And they dialyse you then, then you have to be on dialysis, so they can dialyse all the waste materials away. Mm -hmm. it takes that's over, and that's what dialysis is all about. Mm -hmm. It takes away all the waste products in your blood. Mm -hmm. That's why they have the fistula up here, and they collect the big needle in there, mm -hmm. And the fistula joins, and they have what they call an AV shunt. So it's an atriovenous shunt. So yeah, they join an artery and a, a vein together, so they can get all the waste products out up mm -hmm. through your system. Is that what about when they do it on the stomach? You That's um, peritoneal dialysis. <coughs> oh, when you're really and they're flushing big, out, yeah. yeah, to take it all out. Yeah, That's normally That's the painful. first stage, That's a first, oh, and then they put in the fistulas. Oh, okay. So, the excretion of sodium is generally accompanied by the excretion of which substance? Salt. Sodium is salt. Salt, yeah. Water. Oh, water. Water. Yeah. It's a good one to remember. So, when we're putting out sodium, it has to go out with the water because you don't want to be peeing salt. <laughs> it could be a bit painful. So, we want to put out water so it, it's dilute and we can get rid of it. 
Now, I mentioned about hormones a bit earlier. Hormones bind to... Tissue and organs. Remember, I kept saying it's an important thing to remember. For which they are targeted. Remember, I mentioned in the endocrine system, it said target tissues and organs. Target tissues and organs. So, the hormones in our system released from wherever are normally set to go to a particular tissue or organ. So, we send off a hormone that goes down to our kidneys to tell them to release more blood cells, more red blood cells. And why people, when they get hormonal imbalances, get things like a rapid heart rate, get a heart, their heart flutter. Menopause. Blood. Important part, we've been talking about it. It is the thing that is most profuse, profound, profuse in our body. It circulates everything. It helps us get rid of waste. It does lots and lots of things. So we just talk about blood for a minute on this. Is there more fun than that? What is blood? Blood is actually a mixture of cells suspended in a slightly yellowish liquid called plasma. Plasma is made up mostly of water, but it also contains proteins, sugars, hormones, and salts. The three different types of cells you'll find in plasma are red blood cells, or erythrocytes, white blood cells, or leukocytes, and platelets, or thrombocytes. Red blood cells give the blood its color and make up 40 to 45% of your blood. They're round and look a little like a donut without the hole in them. Their main job is to carry oxygen to the other cells of the body and to take away the carbon dioxide as a waste property. Red blood cells only live four months, but healthy bone marrow produces four to five billion red cells every hour to keep replenishing the ones that wear out. White blood cells, on the other hand, are the body's defense system. They all fight infection from bacteria, viruses, all those nasty microbes that can cause disease. Whenever germs begin to infect your body, they send out a signal that the granulocyte recognizes. Just as soon as the granulocyte detects the signal, it begins its journey to the site of the infection. When at last they find the invader germ, they quickly move in for the kill, first attacking the invader and then eating it. Something else that is truly amazing is how the platelets work. Platelets are small pieces of cell material, or cytoplasm, whose job it is to plug holes in the vessel walls. So, say you're standing inside the blood vessel and looking at the tear in its wall, you'd see millions of platelets responding to the injury, throwing themselves over the cut. They stick to the wound's edges and to each other to form a plug that slows the loss of blood within three to five minutes. A platelet plug will last for only 24 to 72 hours because the platelets run out of energy and begin to fall apart. But as long as there is still an unhealed hole in the blood vessel wall, the clot will continue being formed, dissolved, and reformed to stop and prevent more bleeding from occurring. When the wound is completely healed by the new cells growing over it, the clot will be cleared away and blood will begin to flow through the vessel normal. So is that like, say you cut your finger, no, say you cut your finger, yep. and, and it so stops plate, bleeding over. Platelets, the platelets come along yeah. and they go over, they, they basically make a, like a, I suppose a covering yeah. mm -hmm. over the actual inside of the vessel wall yeah. and stop the bleeding. Right. And then it goes white, like my finger. Remember you said to me it's gone white? So yep. it means the white blood cells are That means yeah, happy, that's happy. about circulation to your finger yeah. when you get the tip of it. But when you get the pus underneath, yeah. that's the white blood cells all going there and trying to consume the bad stuff. Yeah, you know, all the bad bacteria or you know, material that's infecting it. So if covered on something like a rusty knife, yeah. along come the white cells. Yeah. So the plug and it builds a bit of pressure under there and you'll get a build up of pus underneath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the greenish colour of pus is actually what it's consumed as right. white blood cells. Yeah. And um, so they, they're not always bad to have pus, it's only when the infection gets out of control mm -hmm. and there's excessive amounts of it in a wound and it's exuding it. 
that we have to look at it and say, oh, we need antibiotic for this. Yeah. And the smell. The smell. Oh, that's all the dead blood cells. Yeah. So what's the antibiotics that they have to give you? Uh, um, for example, my daughter got attacked by mozzies this weekend. Yep. And they so she's got boils. a skin base? They turned to like boils and yep. I, the antibiotics they gave didn't work so we had to take her to the hospital for the weekend yep. in order to give them... So they blood. would have given them probably something like flagell, yep. um, which is a skin-based antibiotic which attacks your skin. Depending on that, they do a blood test and they would try to determine what type they are. So they'll give you a general antibiotic because it's a surface one. Well, they gave her normal antibiotics, but the ones that they gave her in the hospital had a warning on the bag. Yeah, most antibiotics do that. Oh, do they? Mm. Oh, and it's only a tiny little... It's like a 100 mil bag? Yeah. And it's flat. It's normally flagell. Flagell. Comes in 100 mils, yep. And that's like the strongest... Type. That's for... That's the, the, the strongest type IV is given because it's more effective going through your blood because it's not... You can consume flagell orally, yeah, but it's more effective. So I give her a good bag going through there, yeah. and that will attack those skin bacteria that are coming in. Because they're normally things like Staphylococcus come off your skin that are normally floating around on your skin, mm -hmm. but will get into wound, and they normally don't have a hole to get inside. So yeah, an infected mozzie bite is normally they'll give you a flagell. Then sometimes they'll also include in that they'll give you. Things like amoxicillin. That's what she's on now. Yeah. But as soon as she was finished the bag, you could see the difference straight away. Yep. She was up walking around. She whereas yep. before, she's feeling better. Yeah. She's not, her body's not fighting that bacteria as quickly. Mm. And so I give her amoxicillin because it's now internalised, and amoxicillin works on a general. And they probably did a blood screen on her, and in a few days she'll get an answer back. And if it's not, they'll call you up and say, look, we need to change this antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Go to your GP and get whatever it is they recommend. Mm -hmm. So, I thought that was interesting. It's normally about 7 to 8% <coughs> of our total body weight, our blood. To me, that's pretty amazing, considering all the big organs we have. Mm -hmm. Right? This is an essential fluid, as we said, it carries out the critical functions of transporting oxygen and nutrients to our cells. And then it gets rid of the CO2. So ammonia and other waste products. In addition, it plays a vital role in our immune system in maintaining a relatively constant body temperature. How do you think it does that? How do you think blood helps maintain our body temperature? What do you do when you get really hot? Oh, sweat. You get flushed, don't you, as well? You sweat, you get flushed, so the blood rushes to the skin surface. Why do you think it would rush to the skin surface for your capillaries? To cool down. To cool down. So the air outside, you hope, it's nice and cool, right, is flying across and actually cooling the blood so it circulates back in a cooler way. So it tries to cool down your body temperature. It's when we want to constrict our blood flow, is why we make it colder, don't we? But if, we, if we're warm, then we get red. So that's how, in the hot days, you'll get a pinkish hue, and you'll, it's your blood trying to cool your body down. So it plays a vital role in our immune system as well, as I said, body temperature. It's a specialised tissue. Blood is a tissue, right? Composed of more than 4,000 different components. I did not know that. Four of the most important ones are the red cells. You mentioned what they do. The white cells that fight the bacteria. The platelets that plug the um, <coughs> lacerations, cuts or whatever, or damage to the wall. And the plasma, which is that nice yellowish fluid that it all travels in. The function of blood. The function of blood is to protect against infection, regulate body temperature, transport nu nutrients, oxygen, and prevent the loss of body fluid. The blood cells, right, by the use of clotting. That's what it does. It protects our body. It's a controller. So what is the normal pH of blood? 
7.35 to 7.45. Remember we talked about acidity, alkalosis and acidity? <coughs> Remember, don't ever get confused about other pHs. pH of your urine and all that's different. This is the pH of blood. What does hemoglobin, why does hemoglobin contain iron? So what does iron do? Touches the oxygen. So it transports oxygen as well as CO2. So the iron it attaches up, the iron makes it attach the oxygen so it can travel around through your body, oxygenate your cells, and it gets rid of that carbon dioxide back to your lungs to get rid of it, to breathe it out. Anybody have any questions at this point in time? It's always nice as we're friends. I think we'll have a pause for 10 minutes, guys. Mm -hmm. Get yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, or those of you who haven't got a coffee, drink. I don't care if you drink or eat in here, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs>